Okay, guys, and welcome to episode 10 of CASCAST. Today on CASCAST, we have Steve Morley. Steve Morley is an inclusion sports coach, author, and public speaker. He has over 25 years of experience gained working with people from disadvantaged minority groups, mental health service users, refugee and homeless communities, and people with both physical and learning disabilities. During the nine years that Steve worked with Cambridge City Council, he has coordinated the council invigorate program using sport and physical activities to engage with mental health service users. He is also an assist caregiver which is applied suicide intervention skills and trained and in addition to this he is into his many other coaching roles Steve is a trustee with the charity Steel Bones an organization that supports people through the physical and mental challenges of limb loss. When not coaching or delivering workshops Steve lectures in equality and diversity and is a member of the Cambridgeshire County Football Association Inclusion Advisory Group. Steve is also a qualified Level 2 badminton coach, an assistant athletics coach under England Athletics, a wheelchair basketball coach and possesses further qualifications in adapting exercise for older adults and people with disabilities. Well, mate, you've been a busy man over the last 25 years. Well, yes, thanks, Callum. Incredible. That's quite, quite thanks a, for coming on. No, no problem. And that's quite a build-up, uh, so no pressure then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no pressure at all. But everything you've done there is, uh, yeah, it's incredible. It's, it, it's, it's great how much you've done for people. So, so let's start with that, really, mate. Um, so sort of what first, you t- you t- what first led you to this uh, journey of like, helping other people? Um, I guess it can, goes right back to when I was a little lad, really. Um, yeah. I, uh, my parents split up when I was about two, and I went to live with my grandparents. Uh, and where they lived was uh, mostly old people, and uh, with, there weren't many young families there, so there weren't many other kids to play with. So yeah. I was left on my own for quite, quite a long time. And then when I got to about um, seven or eight, um, something quite magical happened because the house next to my grandparents became vacant. And a lady moved in called, called Mrs. Davis. And Mrs. Davis changed my life, really, because she was a foster mother. She was one of these ladies who took people in, uh, children in, to look after. Uh, and where we lived in the East End of London, it was uh, even then, in the sort of late 50s, early 60s, it was quite multicultural. Um, so I found myself like uh, living and playing with kids from all over the world. Yeah. Um, kids from uh, Africa, kids from Asia, kids from the Indian subcontinent and amongst those children were several children that had various disabilities okay and I must have been about I suppose eight or nine at the time and usually they were about a year or so younger than me yeah um and in the east end at that time you you probably heard the story about everybody leave their door open and everything yeah and our two houses at the end of the garden there was a gate that linked the two houses um, from when my nan and the lady who lived there before used to just go into each other's gardens and, and, and go into their houses. So two gardens sort of became one and we played with all the kids. Uh, and that really formed my you know, early sort of impressions of, of people with disabilities, people with differences, people whose yeah. skin colour wasn't the same as mine, people whose culture wasn't the same as mine and people whose physicality wasn't the same as mine. And that kind of just set the stage, really. And from then on in, that dictated how I went through the world. Um, yeah. And I guess that sort of helping people came from that, from then, from that very early stage, really. Yeah. So it, it's been with me. I'm now 66 years old. Yeah. I was eight then. It's been with me ever since, just growing, really. Amazing, mate. That's that's brilliant. So. What about when you went into uh, went into adulthood? You know, eighteen, got into your twenties. What what was your first experience of like work in life? I um I started life uh, as a graphic designer. Actually, okay. uh, I was always kind of quite artistic, um, and the two passions in my life were art and sport. Strangely enough, yep. Um, <clears throat> and I used to because uh, I was an only child. I used to write and draw and paint, and I used to spend a lot of time on my own when I wasn't. You know, playing with these these kids next door. Yeah. Um, obviously, that was during the day. In, in the evening time, I was I was left to my own devices. So, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> I was quite interested in sport. I was quite interested in art. I didn't think I was good enough to make a career in sport. Okay. But I thought I might have been good enough to make a career in art and design. Yeah. And so that's when I left school. That's that's what I did. I, I became a, a graphic designer. Yeah. Uh, and that I, I worked as a graphic designer. 
well into my sort of thirties, really. Okay. Just before I decided to reinvent myself. <laughs> okay. And was there like a um, a particular moment you can remember where you thought, you know what? Um, I don't want to be a graphic designer anymore. I want to go into this new line of work. Was there one moment sort of that, that led up to it? Um, I think it was probably a gradual thing. Um, yeah. The, the problem with the difference between graphic design and, and, and uh, free art, if you want, um, is that um, when, you're, when you're working as a graphic designer, you're, trying, you're always constrained by the, by the customer and the client. Um, and many times you would do something that you thought was was good mm -hmm. and then and then the company would say well you know can we make this a little bit bigger or can we make that a little bit smaller or how about if we change things around and it used to frustrate me because mm -hmm. i used to think you've employed me as a designer and and now you're redesigning it yeah so you know either i design it or or you might as well just design it yourself yeah. and many times i was dissatisfied with the end result and didn't want my name on it and all the while i was coaching even while i was working full-time i was coaching yeah uh, and doing various sports and then I guess what happened was was I, I suddenly decided, you know, do do you want to spend your rest of your life redesigning baked bean tin labels, yeah, or or do you want to kind of you know devote yourself full time to to, to coaching and sport, yeah, where and particularly you know uh, coaching disadvantaged kids, yeah, and and make a difference, yeah. It's a bit of a cliche, but so you must you have know. felt like you just had a lot more to offer in another area. You had more of a, a like a passion, yeah, that you wanted to, to get into. Yeah, and I mean, the biggest problem, of course, is 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 it's financial. You know, because yeah. there is, you, you know, you compare the money you can earn as a graphic designer and the money you can earn as a sports coach. Yeah, um, there's no comparison. So, but. You know, I know, again, it's a cliche, but it's, it's never kind of really been about the money. As I'm, I'm one of these people, as long as I've got kind of enough, yeah. then... And you're then, passionate about what you're doing. Yeah, you're, as you're long happy. as I've got enough to pay yeah. the bills. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not that materialistic. I don't want lots of things. Yeah. I'm much more uh, into experiences. And, and yeah. if I have money, I like to use that money to experience things, to travel or to, to, yeah. to, to rather than buy more stuff. You know? Yeah, 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 definitely. Brilliant, mate. Okay, so you said about a sport and that was, that was a, you know, a real, a real passion of yours. Mm. Um, obviously playing sport when, when you're younger. And then you said when you was a graphic designer, you was doing a little bit of coaching on mm -hmm. the side. Yeah. Um, what, what sports were you coaching and, and how did you get into that? Well, it's, it's interesting. Like I said, I, I've always loved sports. Yeah. But um, ironically, when I was young, I had really bad asthma. Okay. Um, so uh, sort of sports where I had to sort of really, uh, you know, use a lot of physical energy yeah. uh, were always were, was difficult for me. And, mm. and I, lo I love sports like at school, I love volleyball, I love badminton, I love cricket, I love football, um, but I was always kind of, I was always kind of having, you know, yeah. asthma attacks, right. and and I had to have the like the the classic blue in, inhaler from from very yeah. very young, um, but it never really stopped me really, and 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 in fact it was because I was asthmatic that I took up running, yeah, um, because the sports I used to love to play were were volleyball, cricket, football, and badminton, and strangely enough, yeah. I. I I actually got really good at badminton and I got to the stage where I was sort of county and above standard. Okay. Um, but I was always, <laughs> if, if the matches went on too long and I mm. couldn't put the, my opponent away, I used to be dead on the court because <laughs> I, my, my stamina and endurance wasn't really good. And, yeah. and I got into running because the team captain one time just got so fed up with me losing a game that I was winning. And yeah. he said to me, you need to get fitter. Have you thought about running? And I, okay. said, and I said, no, because when I was a kid, I hated cross-country running, you know, yeah, uh, so with my I. asthma. <laughs> and um, he said, yeah, no, you need to get into running. And, that, and that's how I got into running, strangely okay. enough, to get, not, not because I wanted to run, but as a means to get fit for my yeah. badminton. Yeah. So it was badminton that I was coaching. Okay. It, was, um, it was football that I was coaching. Uh, it was basketball that I was coaching, yeah. basically, when I was, when I was working as a designer. Badminton and basketball, brilliant. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, in terms of your coaching experience, now sport has always had a huge impact on my life and your life as well when you when you was younger. Yeah. Um, through your coaching, through what you've seen, what what positive um, you know impacts can that have on a young person's sport? Not only the physical benefits, but what else can have you seen in your experience that it, it can really have on a young person? Yeah, I think um, it's it's interesting. There's lots and lots of cliches around sport, but yeah. it, but it is a kind of microcosm of life, really. And and I really feel sorry for people who don't get sport and who don't enjoy sport, yeah. um, because if you are one of these people that you you grow up and you 
you don't have any experience with sport and, and if you find yourself lucky enough to have parents that support you and and you don't have any challenges in your life everything's yeah. done for you everything's provided for you you know you never suffer dis- disappointment mm. um you know you never have to deal with adversity um and and obviously in the real world you shouldn't have to but sport gives you that little taste of yeah. of those experiences that are magnified in life so if you take part in any kind of sporting activity that's competitive uh, you win some and you lose some mm. and it's painful losing um but you you know you you learn so much from losing and and one of my one of my mentors was a guy called Lee J Bock and he was the Korean national coach and in fact he coached um, uh, the British team when badminton was first allowed into the Olympics okay. in Barcelona yeah he was the Olympic coach um, and and he always used to say that it didn't really matter if you never ever picked up a badminton racket again in yeah. you know, as an adult the lessons that you learn playing the game will stay with you forever mm-hmm. so being a, a good loser but also being humble in in yeah. winning in victory not lording it over people you know yeah. not not um being humble and and when you lose not thinking oh that was unfair or my mm-hmm. racket was no good or my coach was no good or i was unlucky yeah. but kind of taking responsibility for your loss and thinking about well, okay you know what did you do what could you do differently what could yeah. you do better and, and taking every defeat as a as a stepping stone to, to getting better and improving, yeah. And and those sort of attitudes of sort of I know again they're old fashioned attitudes, but fair play, you know, sort of, um, you know, being humble, being honourable, mm-hmm. um, uh, and and those kind of lessons you can you can really learn from sport. They're very valuable lessons for young for youngsters, and if they they take on that mindset, yeah. Um, supporting your teammates. Um, you know, com- good communication, good leadership skills. Yeah. All those things can come from sport yeah. um, and they're life skills. So yeah, they're transferable, you, aren't absolutely. they? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And there must be, um, you know, there must be a difference between what you learn from uh, participating in a team sport versus an individual sport. They both sort of um, teach you, uh, you know, teach you different lessons. Like I've played basketball and I've also played uh, I've also played a lot of tennis, um, and there's great things about both. And have yeah. you found that in your experience as well? And do you think that some people's personalities suit one or the other, or some people are drawn towards more of an individual and certainly. more of a team? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Certainly, some people some people don't like team team games as much, team sports as much. Yeah, because they they feel that they have more responsibility mm. over their the outcome. Yeah, so they're not relying on on, on people. But sometimes that sometimes that's worth reflecting on because sometimes that's uh something that you th- you think about okay is that coming from ego yeah and is that a positive thing so it, it there's it's a fine balance between saying well you know I, I i want to do this on my own because then you know the responsibility is mine i'm not For relying sure. on anybody else yeah which is great but no man is an island so if you go for your whole life mm. with that attitude not wanting to rely on anybody else yeah you know it's very very difficult and that sometimes in your life you have to rely on other people yeah to, to, to and sometimes relying on other people can yeah. actually make you stronger and yeah. give a better outcome not being afraid to ask for help when you Absolutely. need help and that transfers yeah. to that yeah i mean a lot of the work that i do currently is around mental health and yeah um and and men especially are, are just so bad about talking about their feelings yeah uh, and 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 that comes from very deep rooted sort of macho kind of yeah you know men don't cry and men don't share their feelings and stuff um well if you kind of get used to uh, as a youngster sort of supporting one another yeah so going back to the badminton really quick um lee j bock used to get us to do drills so we would do like sumo squats mm-hmm. so the whole team of 12 people would would sit would go in a circle and do a sumo squat yeah yeah, yeah. um and we'd had to hold it for a certain amount of time. Okay. Uh, and if you couldn't hold it for that and somebody got up, then the whole team would have to get up and we'd have to start again. Yeah. It's a really <laughs> powerful incentive. Yeah, for sure. To that hang team in there. effort, yeah. To Similarly, help we used to do yeah. runs. We used to do runs and yeah. you, only, you can only stay as fast as your slowest runner. Okay. So that does two things. It, it allows your faster runners to be more compassionate and more supportive. Yeah. But you as a slower runner, it just, you, you excel, you run 
so much harder and faster than you would if you knew you could just drop out. Yeah. Because you know your teammates are supporting it's you. It's great what you said there, because if you are the fastest runner and you're always out in front on your own, you're actually not going to develop any more skills. No. You drop back and you start to communicate more and help others. All of a sudden, you're developing yourself yeah, and becoming absolutely. more of a leader. Absolutely. So, yeah. so I think... Yes, you're right. There, there, there are people who excel in a team environment, yep. and there are people that excel, uh, you know, as a sole um, participant. Um, but I think it's good if you can do a bit of both. Yeah, if you're a young person and you just like sport in general, you're not particularly focused on one. Mm. You would recommend just trying a little bit of both. Just try an individual sport and try a team sport as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant, mate. Great. Cool. Okay. So, um, could we have a, a quick chat about the the work you're doing um, in schools currently and uh, the Limitless Games, and just tell the listeners about the Limitless Games. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I've been doing work in schools for the longest time, even when I was still working as a graphic designer. Yeah. Some of the little um, sort of freelance jobs I, I got were were working in schools. <coughs> Okay. Um, but I suppose it, it started uh, seriously um, when I first started working for Cambridge City Council because yeah. uh, my first job there was as a community sports coach and uh, part of that remit, it was a sort of three year project and part of my remit was going into schools and doing lunchtime and after school clubs. So. I started doing uh, badminton and uh, multi-sport clubs and um, athletic and basketball clubs. Um, so I was, I was quite used to um, going into schools. And as I, I transcended from a community sports coach to a um, yep. senior sports development officer, okay. uh, part of my work still involved working with schools. Um, and I started kind of doing a lot of work in special educational needs schools, so working with children with disabilities, physical and neurological disabilities, and um, started doing, um, using sort of what I call soft skill sports because they were very easily to, adaptable for people with physical disabilities and because they were quite simple games, if you had a learning dif difficulty, um, you, could, you could follow the game and, and participate quite easily. So. There are lots of sort of disability specific games that are played in the Paralympics and things, yep. but I started kind of taking some mainstream games and simplifying them and adapting them myself. So um, doing badminton, I started doing zonal badminton where you have more people on court, they use larger rackets, they only have to stand in a particular zone, mm -hmm. so all they, they have, you know, they don't have to worry about getting around the court, they yep. have one small area to defend and they have a larger racket okay. to, to do it. So, so zonal badminton and things like that. And then um, I started, work, when I retired from the city council, I started developing those projects. Uh, I also did a project called Better Together where I found a, a special needs school and I invited children from a mainstream school to come and play games together. Yeah. And that was very empowering and, and, and worked really well. Um, but uh, a charity called Steel Bones um, contacted me and said that they were newly formed and they wanted to do some work in schools. They'd already been going into schools and doing like school assemblies yeah. and talking, but they wanted to do something around sport and could I develop a little program for them that would allow them to go into schools. <coughs> so I came up with the idea of Limitless Games, which was a pun on limb, so limb it less. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and my own experience from uh, dealing with primary school children was that um, where disability was concerned, um, there was a particular stigma around amputees. Mm -hmm. So if a young child saw somebody with a limb missing, mm -hmm. occasionally it, it was frightening for them. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't really helped in a lot of cases by parents who kind of said, you know, come away, come away, don't stare. Right. And in one case, you know, I actually heard a lady sort of almost like threaten the child with this person who was an amputee. You know, she said, come away, you know, the man will get you, the man will get you, you know, right. which you think in this day and age was actually disgraceful. But yeah. it still happens. You still hear that, that, that kind of thing. Um, so I thought, well, if we got people with amputations to come in and talk to the kids, but also play sports with the kids. Ma yeah. Mainly, maybe we get them as volunteers and maybe they support our um, our mainstream coaches yeah. and shadow our coaches. That would be good. That would be a good program. So we developed the Limitless Games, which involves, it's purely to do with primary schools. 
okay. and we, we go in, we do a school assembly, the kids get to ask questions, and then we do two hours of, of adaptive and inclusive sports with the kids. Yeah. And it's aimed at key stage two. Okay. Um, it lasts for two, two and a bit hours. Yeah. Um, and we've done, we've done schools in Essex, we've done schools in Cambridgeshire, yeah. we've done schools in Peterborough, um, and in, in Norfolk. Yeah. Um, it's been going for about a year and a half, two years. Okay. And yeah. it's been really successful. Yeah, incredible. So generally, what um, when uh, when the guys come in from Stillbones and they do the talks, mm. um, you said th there's a certain amount of time where the children actually get to ask questions. Yep. What are the general questions that normally oh, come up? Wow, they're amazing I'm questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, sure they are really amazing questions. They they you have all the standard ones like, does it hurt? Yeah. Will it grow back? Yeah. How did you lose? I'm your I'm sure as soon as one the first question gets asked, then they all start. They all yeah. start coming. They do. They they yeah. They they ask kind of things like uh, sometimes they ask really sensible questions, mm. like uh, do you wear your leg in the shower? Okay. Yeah. Yep. And that's really interesting because I I learn an awful lot. Um, yeah. I mean I've worked with disabilities for years, but yeah. you know I've learned so much about different kinds of prosthetics. Yeah. Um and and also different kinds of limb loss and the sort of problems. I learned an awful lot about phantom pain as well, which I didn't really know too okay. much about because you kind of think that you know if you have something wrong, yeah. and, it, and it's taken away, yeah. Then that's the end of the problem. But so many people who have had amputations um, have have some awful problems and awful challenges with phantom pain that sometimes lasts for years okay um so that's an interesting thing because that's a kind of obviously a mental and psychological yeah. thing yeah so i'm interested in that but the kids ask some amazing questions the best questions that we ever had was all these kids asked all these really sensible questions yeah and um towards the end we was like okay we'll have to wrap up now and one little girl put her hand up and and mark who's one of our volunteer amputees answered her and she said do you believe in unicorns Okay. <laughs> nice one to finish off yeah. with. And he yeah. said, uh, "Well, do you believe in unicorns?" And she said, "Yes, I do." And he said, "Well, yeah. if you believe it, I believe it." Okay, that's brilliant. Okay, cool. And then after the talk, like you say, that you'll go into some sports and some activities. So, what are some of those activities that they do with the children? Well, we do um, we do sit in volleyball, which, okay. is, which is really good. Um, yep. uh, we do uh, boccia. We do new age curling. Um, we like to kind of do a lot of visually impaired stuff yeah. because what, what we try to say to the school is it's about breaking down barriers yeah, but we sure. also like to try and if we can make some learning outcomes so for example you know we want to have the children they go each the, the children uh, get broken into groups of three or four mm -hmm. and then they all rotate around the different activities so they're, they're doing an activity for maybe 10, 15 minutes. Yep. And what we sort of tend to say to them is like, um, okay, we're going to do VI football, visually impaired football, where they bl wear blindfolds yep. and the ball has bells in it. So kids come over and you say, oh, well, you know, what have you been doing? So, oh, we've been playing VI football. Well, okay, what's, what's that then? How does that work? Oh, well, we're all wearing blindfolds. Well, how do you know where the ball is? Oh, well, it's got a bell in it, you know, yeah. or, or something like that. Or, or what you've been doing, oh, we've been doing sitting volleyball. Well, sitting volleyball, I've not heard of that. What's, what's yeah, that all about? Yeah, I've heard of volleyball, you know, big high net, you have to yeah. leap up. Yeah, yeah, but if you're in a wheelchair or if you have no legs, you can't jump. So what, what we do is we lower the net and then everybody's the same. We're it's such a great playing. way of, of, like you say, breaking down in barriers because... You know, you're getting the children. You're not just talking at them. You're getting them involved, and that, and they're physically experiencing it and enjoying themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And 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 that's why um, the limitless games particularly works well with with um, with primary school children. Yeah. Um, I was I was at a school, a high school, um, earlier this week, and the teacher said, "I'd quite like to do the limitless games." And I said, "Well, it, to be honest, it, that concept particularly doesn't work so well with older kids." because by the time they've got into senior school, they've got a really competitive head on them mm -hmm. and it's, they're very blinkered. And you try and introduce these soft skills and you try and make the point. And what you sometimes get is, oh, this is boring. You know, why are we doing this? And, oh, you know, what's the score and who's winning? And yeah. because they're very, they're very wired into that uh, concept yeah. of sport that and what mindset sport, of what that, sport is exactly yeah. so you constantly have to keep reminding them okay well yeah you might find it boring but if you mm -hmm. were in a wheelchair you would find it empowering yeah and this is why yeah oh yeah i suppose so but when can we do something else you know and who's winning and uh, whereas the little ones and especially when you go into special needs school you n for you in special needs school you never ever hear anybody asking what the score is you never yeah. ever hear anybody asking who's winning 
because they're just totally into the participation. They're into the, They're in the more in the moment. And just enjoy it, like Absolutely. you say, enjoying the participation and enjoying the fact that they can now um, express they can now themselves, express themselves yeah, and do sure. something that, that they really previously sense. couldn't do. Yeah, that's Absolutely. amazing. Good, brilliant. That's great. That was such a great positive thing uh, to do. Amazing. So let's. Um, Let's go on to uh, at Still uh, Still Bones Charity. I know um, we've talked about it. Would you be able to go into it in a little bit more detail and also how you became a trustee? Sure. Well, the charity was formed by uh, two people who have become obviously very good friends of mine now, um, Emma Joy Staines and Lee Joy Staines. Yeah. And Lee um, uh, lost his leg. He's a, he's a lower, lower leg amputee. Um, and like a lot of people, I guess, they, they had, had no experience of disability at all. And uh, um, they had these challenges. Lee was in hospital for quite a lot of the time. It became apparent he was going to have to uh, lose his leg. You have the kind of uh, drama and the trauma that people go through when they have to suddenly have this realization that they're going to lose a limb. Um, yeah. But he was very well cared for uh, within the national health system. He has no problems with, with that. He had great care. But the problem with with the national health system is that it's very overstretched and it can only support you for a certain amount of time and so what tends to happen is you go through the system you're given your prosthetic leg which is mm -hmm. a basic bog standard nhs prosthetic yeah and away you go get on with the rest of your life and the questions of what well what am i going to do about my job and my employment am i going to be able to drive am i entitled to any benefits Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what's going to become of me now? What's my life going to look like from now on? That support wasn't there. Or at least it didn't appear to be there when Emma first started looking. Mm -hmm. In truth, if you look a bit deeper, there, there are organisations out there for sure. And, and there are a lot of good organisations out there. But Emma thought that there was, there was a lack of support. And, and particularly as a mother of two children, she found that Often it's the families that have the trauma to deal with. Their life is disruptive yeah. as well. So Steel Bones was, was, came into existence to provide support to amputees, but also to support the families of, okay. of amputees. And, and so that's how it kind of started. And it grew sort of quite small, you know, very, essentially a kitchen table charity. Um, and, it, and it grew steadily and steadily. They yep. decided they wanted to make some children's books. Okay. They decided they wanted to make some family packs to support people. They, uh, they wanted to install a kind of, um, not a Samaritans, but a kind of buddy system where, where people, if they had problems, could, could phone someone up. So all these things they were looking to do. And as I say, they'd already started going into schools. And so they thought that they could expand that. And they thought that sport would be a good way of spreading the message. And... Um, so they, they asked me to, to get involved initially as a supporter and, and someone to, to uh, design the, the programme of the Limitless Games. But then I was very proud that they asked me if I'd like to be a trustee. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, was happy, I was happy to agree. Because um, you know, they, obviously I have some marketing experience, I have some design experience as well as my experience with sport. Um, and also because I'd been a senior sports development officer with the city council, I'd had quite a lot of experience attending meetings and chairing meetings and things like that. I had a lot yeah. of experience putting in funding applications and, and working with larger organisations. So they felt that that was valuable and hopefully I've been helpful to the charity. Yeah, I'm sure you have. That's amazing. So as well as the, um, as well as the Limitless Games, what other sort of projects are going on? What else is going on with the... The, the charity at the moment well as i say they they do um a lot of um uh, events um, yep. one of the interesting thing that the, the the amputee community if you will yep. um often you find yourself quite isolated and so uh, what they found is they did sort of celebration days and they did um christmas parties and they did social events like bowling and things like that mm -hmm. and they started doing these um and they thought, well, we need to kind of give value to these. So with the celebration day, they thought, oh, we'll have some sports and we'll have some entertainment and things like yep. this. And last year, uh, they organised a lot of activities. But we had, in the middle of a beautiful summer, if you remember, we yep. had two or three days where it was pouring with rain. And it was just like bad luck that it poured a rain on the day of the celebration day. So a lot of the extra activities, like we had people 
come going to do drone flying and things like that. Yep. That had to be cancelled. And we were really concerned that our oh, people would be disappointed. But everybody just loved coming together. Mm. And so we sort of learned that the most important thing was an opportunity to, to bring people together. So it, Steel Bones looks to do more of these little events okay. where, where basically people can come and yeah. meet other amputees yeah. because you then meet other people that are on different stages of their journey yeah so you might be a Can recent give you amputee. some good advice yeah, yeah. Well, you might be a recent amputee and you might be in a very low and dark place yeah just without knowing what's going to become of you and then you meet someone who has has had exactly the same experience exactly the same amputation yeah. exactly the same amputation but they're like a year down the down the journey or, or two years down the journey and they're running and they're playing sports yeah. and they're you know and they're working and and you just think well they're exactly the same as me. They're yeah. roughly the same age as me. If if that's where they can be, well, then so that's where I can be. So yeah. inspirational. Yeah. What an amazing charity. So, how quickly and how big has uh, Steel Bones, you know, grown? And and wh when did it start? And <clears> from <throat> when it started to where it is now? Because, you know, all what you're saying is just it, it's such an it offers such an incredible amount of support to people. Um, you know, you said that you can become quite isolated. Mm. Um as well as still bones what other uh, support you know is out there for civilian amputees it's interesting that you say about civilian amputees because one of the one of the questions we often get asked yeah. or, or, or people refer to is, is people in the military yeah and i have quite a lot of good friends who have been part of the invictus games and yeah um there's, there's in fact one of um one of the Steel Bones supporters is a guy called Owen Pick, and, and Owen is a Paralympic snowboarder, mm -hmm. um, and he lost his leg, I think he left, lost his leg in Afghanistan yeah. uh, uh, while he was part of the military. Um, but the military these days have an enormous kind of uh, structure, a support structure for, for their soldiers um, uh, who have lost limbs. So the, the military really have it kind of really well sussed now. But on the civilian side, as I say, there are little pockets of organisations. So there's quite a good well-known charity called Limb Power, and, okay. and they support. And there's various um, companies that provide prosthetics, and they have those companies. Although they're commercial companies producing um, prosthetic limbs, they've kind of expanded and to become more, almost like more like a social enterprise company yeah. in that they're they're providing a support structure. But there was no, there's no overarching um, charity. They're all little pockets of, of people out there doing really good work, and you yeah. need to find them. Um, so Steel Bones is trying to spread itself as thin as it can. I mean, it started probably about three years ago. I, yeah. would, I would say so probably the, maybe the third year, or, or maybe we're just going into our third year after Christmas. Um, but certainly not been going very long. Yeah. Uh, and and it's still finding its way a little bit. It's still yeah. sort of saying, well what kind of stuff can we do we're doing the events we're doing the limitless games um the physical stuff is important so one of the other th projects they asked me to do was um could i do a fitness club mm. um so i do a um, steel bones functional fitness club and i do it right. at a local gym after the gym closes okay um we, we started doing it um during normal opening hours and that was fine when we had the more um mobile amputees yeah. but of course when you have somebody who's a double leg amputee in a chair then in a gym environment you know yourself it's sometimes a bit claustrophobic yeah. and if it's busy then it's, it's kind of it can be difficult and you have this balance between trying to um accommodate the needs of the amputee but also make sure that your regular gym users are not yeah. you know inconvenience so we took the decision to do it as a closed session after the gym had, had, had shut so we do that. We do the Limitless Games Functional Fitness Program. Uh, we do uh, children's books that we're going to start to distribute in schools so that very young children can see characters who have limbs missing yeah. as part of their narrative, part of the story. Yeah. Um, um, and the different events that the, that the charity are, are, are trying to promote. And again, they're finding their way. They're like, what what do people need? What what would people like to see? Yeah, is that something that Steel Bones could provide? So as a growing charity, it's it's always interesting to say, 
well, what what's missing? What can could we fill that void? Is it mm. something Steel Bones could do? Yeah. So it's a learning experience, really, for the charity now. That's brilliant. That's that's great. So if someone's listening to the podcast, um, you know, who uh, is an amputee, or someone's listening who has a friend or a family member who's an amputee that thinks this sounds amazing, they didn't realise this was out there. Um, what what is the best way to contact Steel Bones, and and what can they expect to? Um, you know, to hear on that, that that first time they contact them, H- how does it sort of work? The easiest thing is just look for the, um, just do a Google search for Steel Bones UK, and yeah. and that'll take you to the website. Yeah. There's a website. Um, they're on Twitter. They're on Facebook, um, and on the website, it, you can just join. Okay. Uh, and and Emma particularly is is very very <coughs> supportive. You'll get you'll get an automated response from the website okay. thanking them for their inquiry and saying that someone will be in contact with them. Yep. And then invariably Lee or Emma, sometimes one of the other trustees might contact them and just have a telephone conversation. Yeah. They can they can join Steel Bones and you know and just be part of the overall group. If they need specific help, then help is always available. Emma yep. is, is lovely and she will always be in contact with people and she'll support them and give them advice. There is a, like a helpline um, and it's also it's a forum because I'm not sure how many members we've got now, but we've okay. got quite a few members. And of course, you can then post queries. So if yeah, you say communicate to one yeah, another, you know, yeah. I've got a problem with this, or has anybody had this issue, or anybody mm. had that issue? Then people will come back and say, Well, I had exactly that, and this is mm. what I did, or Have you tried this, or Have you tried that? So it is a growing community. Um, yeah. And as soon as you kind of become part of it, you feel less isolated. Yeah, you feel less sure. alone. Amazing. That's that's great. Good. Thanks for that info, Steve. That's really good stuff there. So what I'd like to do is just um, just sort of quickly go back to your um, you know your experience as a, a disability sports coach, and just generally in that field, um, over recent years, have you really seen that participation grow over the years? Um, I ha- I have. It's a re- it's very interesting. Um, people said that when um, uh, when we had twenty twelve. Yeah. Um, we had the Olympics and then we had the Paralympics and, and, and people were inspired for sure mm-hmm. and people were interested yeah. and there has been a growing acceptance from the mainstream media of the value of, of showing disability sport on TV. Mm-hmm. So for example, it's, it's brilliant these days that you have Wimbledon and as part of the Wimbledon coverage you have the, the wheelchair tennis, yeah. which you never had before. It always went on but you never saw it on the TV, mm-hmm. um, and now it is on the TV. Not all the matches are, are mainstream. Sometimes you have to go on the red button or, or something yeah. like that. But it is available on mainstream. Yeah. Um, the people um, that you see participating, you know, like Johnny Peacock, certainly they do inspire people. In you, if you speak to uh, para athletes, though, one of the things that does annoy them is this sort of um, this attitude that people say, oh, you know, you're so inspiring, you're so inspiring. Um, um, I had a conversation, I won't, I won't say his name on air, but I had a conversation with quite a famous um, para-athlete mm-hmm. who, who said, um, you know, he said, I, I get very fed up with people saying, oh, you're such an inspiration to me. He said, he said if, if I'm an inspiration to you, I want to be an inspiration because... I dedicated so much of my time to my goal. I spent so many hours, you know, busting my neck in in a gym. You yeah. know, I put so much of sacrifice into my training to establish myself in a position to win a gold medal, and I won that. That's what I want my inspiration to be, mm-hmm. not because I did it from a wheelchair. Yeah. So you know, if I'm going to be an inspiration through the hard work, the dedication. Yeah. 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 And it, and it, it there sense. is there is a little bit of sort of. Um, Again, I, I'll tell you a story. Uh, uh, one person that I work for uh, in a charity uh, was born without fully formed limbs, and um, people often said he is such an uh, you know such an inspiration. Yeah. But he was born that way, so he had an awful long time to get used to being how he was. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, it is inspiring that somebody could overcome so many challenges but is it is it as inspiring as somebody who loses two limbs in a car accident and decides that they're going to 
not that not not let them that stop them you know they're going to go on and, and do stuff you know how you adversity in in itself is not inspiring it's it's how you deal with adversity that's the yeah. inspiring thing so the fact that you suffer a trauma it might be sad yeah. and it might be unfortunate and it might be a tragedy but it's how you it's how you deal with that yeah is that is that's the inspirational part for sure yeah so yeah. so to answer your question yes it has it has called caused more people with disability to take up sport which okay. is great there are more people participating in sport but still if i'm going to get political there are still the same barriers uh transport financial you still have to work really hard i i got into a lot of trouble when i worked at the city council because <laughs> i used to say you know i don't live in cambridge i live in suffolk yeah if i lived if i wanted to move to cambridge and i was a sporting person i would i would ring up and i would say you know what sports available and you the, the, the world's your oyster there's so much sport in cambridge you know yeah. you, you're spoiled for choice if however i then said i was a wheelchair user or i was visually impaired or I was an amputee, those opportunities would shrink dramatically to sort of one or two little things. And if I didn't want to do those one or two little sports, mm -hmm. I would, people would say, oh, well, you know, um, I know there's a club in London that you yeah. does, or I know there's a club in Norwich that you can go to. So ultimately, you know? that's what you would like to see for the future, just more variation and just ultimately just more clubs and yeah. options just popping yeah, up. Yeah, and it's a, compl yeah. it's a complex issue. It's not, yeah. it's not a quick fix. You know, in my sport, badminton, court, court time is a premium yeah um, there are lots of very well-meaning badminton clubs who would be would love to do disability sessions yeah. or inclusive sessions or even junior sessions but if they've only got one court mm. and they've got 50 members and they use a pegboard yeah. and their members sometimes have to wait 20 minutes half an hour for a game yeah and they come out to play badminton and they only get two games in an evening mm -hmm. and then you're saying actually can we use that court for half an hour for disability it becomes a really difficult, yeah. you know. So, well, we could have another court. If we could have two more courts, then we would happily do yeah. disability sessions or we would do inclusive sessions, but we just don't have the facilities. So facilities are, you know, yeah. are, are a big problem. And, um, you know, that's that's not an easy fix. No, for sure. But one thing you're doing at the minute, one project you're working on, um, you know, th which is which is really good, and I had to read about it on your website, is a project... Baskin. Yeah, Baskin. Baskin, yeah. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Well, Baskin is, a, is something that I, I only came across myself about two or three years ago. Um, a young lady uh, contacted me, uh, and she'd come over uh, from Italy, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and she'd come over to um, to promote this sport in the in the UK. And um, she asked for my help because she, she, she knew my sort of background um, in, in the same way that Emma did from Steel Bones, really. Mm. I, I, she contacted me and said, could I help her? So I got her on the radio and, and, and got her in the local press and everything. And essentially Baskin, it was a sport, it's been around for a while. It was, um, it was sort of invented um, by a guy in 2003 in Italy. And uh, his daughter um, had complex needs. She was a young girl in a, in a motorized chair. <clears throat> but um, basketball is really big in Italy. People watch it on TV all the time. And she, from a very young age, she loved watching basketball on TV. Yeah. She loved it to bits. Um, so he wanted to try and see if he could get her playing some form of basketball. But she couldn't transition into a chair. She had very uh, poor mobility and poor coordination. So she, she unfortunately, she couldn't, she couldn't participate in wheelchair basketball. Um, so she was excluded. And um, so he thought, well, there must be something around basketball that I could do that would enable her to, to involve. So he got a friend who was an engineer involved and they kind of worked out a game that they could they could they could invent and they came up with the idea of baskin and um essentially the way baskin works it's played on a ma on a full-size basketball court it has the two main baskets at either end but it also has two sh uh, smaller baskets on the side of the court yeah and there is a safe zone so there's an area marked out which is a safe zone the baskets on the side of the court, there is a very low basket that's about the size it level with a wheelchair. And there is a slightly higher basket that's about four feet off mm -hmm. the ground. And 
The teams are mixed, so the teams are boys and girls, and there are only five on each side, and they're graded one to five. So fives is the equivalent of a mainstream basketball player. Mm -hmm. Four might be a mainstream basketball player, or it might be um, a, an older player, yep. or it might be somebody <coughs> with a m mild learning difficulty, who, but somebody who's still got good coordination, good motor skills. Uh, three might be a wheelchair user, but, but m could, could possibly be a wheelchair basketball player, so somebody who's got yep. good shooting skills. But ones and twos would be complex needs. So ones and twos could be somebody with uh, in a motorized chair. Only ones and twos are allowed in a safe zone. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you can only tackle up, you can't tackle down. Okay. So fives, the mainstream players, can only tackle each other. Uh, everybody below, they can only block. Yep. So you can't take the ball off a wheelchair user. Um, the people uh, can tackle up though. So if you're a three, you can tackle a four or a five, mm -hmm. try and get the ball off them. And you score more points if you score in the side pockets. You can't enter the side pocket as the safe zone. You have yep. to pass the ball into the side. So you've got boys and girls on the same court. You've got um, people with quite severe disabilities and people with no disability mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. So one of the things I love about Baskin is that you talked earlier about being able to express yourself. If we are friends and uh, I am a, um, a, a volleyball player and you are a wheelchair user and you invite me to play wheelchair um, sitting volleyball, I come along and I have a lot of fun, but I actually always want to be jumping up and, and yeah. I, I can't really fully express myself yeah. while I'm, I'm making a compromise because of our friendship and I'm playing a different kind of game. Mm -hmm. um, I'm playing sitting volleyball, not mainstream volleyball. Yeah. In Baskin, I can fully express myself. So if I'm a basketball player, I can run the length of the court, I can shoot baskets, yeah, I can fully express myself. But at the same time, I can use my skill, I can try and get the ball into the safe zone so my teammate, who has complex needs, can score in the side pocket yeah. and win us more points. Yeah. So there's an incentive in terms yeah. of, like, it's the equivalent of getting a three-pointer. So I can get it into the side, yeah. get them involved in the game, they score. It sounds like it just enables you know any ability, any age, just to just to get involved and just to play together. And like you say, once again, mm -hmm. it's a sport that's breaking down the yeah. barriers yeah. and just getting everyone included yeah. and playing as a team. Yeah, and yeah. It, and it really does work. It's it's okay. quite it's quite um, interesting the way it works. We yeah. we've done a couple of demos at um, Cambridge University. Yeah, and we did a demo where. We, uh, we got um, guys from the uh, varsity basketball team and we got girls from the varsity netball team uh, playing with um, people with disabilities, yeah, playing brilliant. a game of, of Baskin. Yeah. And it was just really, it was really great fun yeah, to get the, net, the netball girls and the, and the basketball boys yeah. playing on the same team and against one another yeah. and along with people with disabilities. That's really good. That worked yeah. really, really well. Brilliant. So where, um, where is it available? Where can people go and try it? Well, this is, this is the stumbling point we have at the moment. I'm going to Italy uh, in the new year okay. to speak to their national governing body yeah. um, because they're quite keen to support me. Um, the, problem, the problem is it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's a project that I'm trying to juggle with all the other things that I'm trying mm. to do. And it, Busy it's, man. It's something that, it's, it, it's a full time. It would be a full time thing, really, to say, yeah. "Okay, well, I'm retired. My project is to try and get Baskin established in the UK. Um, I'm trying to get it affiliated. So I'm talking to um, the ba uh, Basketball Association and the Basket Wheelchair Basketball Association to see if we can affiliate it rather than start our own governing body. See if we, we can affiliate it. Yeah. If we can affiliate it, then we can organise some level ones." so we can get some people trained up to deliver it. And then once we've got a team of level ones, then we can start rolling it out as, as, as demo sports at sort of sports days and, um, um, you know, go to various schools. We've done a little bit, but it's, it's kind of like, almost, it sounds terrible, but it's almost like when I can fit it in, among other things. Yeah. So, so as I say, we've, we've, we've done a few demos at Cambridge University. One of the, one of the many hats I wear is I, I'm the head coach at a, a club called uh, Cadmus, and that's an adult disability multi-sport club that runs at Cambridge University every Saturday morning. Yeah. 
and um, we've done ca we've done basking there a few times and of course when we've got a session there then we contact the varsity teams and we we get them to come along yeah. and and we can then advertise it as f to the public you know come along and try basking um so we can try it we can we can do it like that and i would i'd like to do more of those sort of things you know yeah um but it is a case unfortunately of trying to sort of fit it in and um so it kind of goes in fits and starts yeah. you know um and it's usually driven by somebody sort of saying oh i saw something on your website or i saw something about basking I, I would like to do it or i would like to yeah. be involved and then that spurs me into action and says okay well let's for sure make gives something you that happen. motivation yeah, yeah. exactly I, keep up the good work mate best you yeah. can because that sounds an ama amazing uh, sport and activity for people to get involved with good Steve, it's been brilliant, mate. Really good. So what I always do at the end of the podcast, um, we just talk about the sort of three uh, areas of inspiration mm -hmm. um, and three areas that sort of inspired you that you would sort of recommend to others. So yep. that'll be a book, film, and a person that's inspired you. So let's start with uh, a book. Have you got a book that you'd recommend to, to the listeners that uh, it's a good book? I, I have, actually. It's um, it's very difficult. I love reading. Mm. I, it's I've, hard uh, to narrow down to one, it I is, know. It is, <laughs> it is. But I think... You know, sometimes you read a book and, and um, something about it resonates and you just think, you, you know, and you, you tend to quote it all the time. It's yeah. a really like, obscure little book and it's called Mini Habits. Okay. And it's by a guy called Stephen Guise and you can find it on Amazon. Uh, and it's about, it's called Mini Habits and it's about establishing habits. And one of the things that really struck me was we all kind of want to do so many things. Um, and in order to do them regularly, we have to get them to be a habit so that we do them without even thinking yeah yeah but uh, establishing a habit is really difficult uh, and getting fit going to the gym is a classic one you know we're coming up to the holidays we'll have new year gym membership will soar because <laughs> yeah. everybody's trying to get fit new year's resolution and then within about you know three or four weeks everybody yeah. will drop off so how do you kind of make that stick one of the things that struck me about this book was he talks about something called the one push-up challenge okay okay Yep. So this is the way the one push-up challenge works. Every day, you do one push-up. That's your commitment. Yeah. Anybody can do one push-up. Yeah. You ask yourself, well, what's the point of that? How how are you ever going to get fit or strong just doing one push-up? That's a waste of time. The thing is, you get down on the floor, you do your one push-up. While you're there, you might do two or three, but you're yep. only committed to doing one. Yeah. That's all you have to do is just do yep. one. Do your one push up. But, but while you're there, <laughs> you might do two or three. Yeah. And then you might do a couple of squats. And then you might do a couple of lunges. Yeah. yeah. Add some extras in. So suddenly that one push up is a 20 minute fitness session that yep. you do. But you're only committed to doing one. And he said in the book, he said uh, one time he had a really, really busy day and he went to bed and he thought, oh, I've forgotten to do my push up. And he said he just turned over in bed and did it in bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's one push. So it's done. <laughs> what I find, I love reading, and and but sometimes I have books that are quite hard going. Yeah. You can set a mini habit. Okay, I only have to read you know, one chapter, okay. or one page. Yeah. That's all I have to do. Yeah. If I read more, great. But I, my money can. It's that mindset so you, of it. It's, so you, it's you better make, than nothing, and you're yeah. making those little. You're sort of building the foundations, yeah. aren't you? If, yeah. If, a, a mini habit needs to be so small that you can't possibly not do it. That makes it's sense. It's so yeah. easy that you okay. can't not do That's it. That's a great little tip for people. I like that. So simple but yeah. effective. Yeah. Mini, mini habits. Yeah, Stephen mini Guys. Habits. Check, check, it, it. check it out. All right, mate. Nice one. And I'll put this up on the screen so people can check it out. Mm. Um, good. Okay, what about a film? you got a film that you'd recommend that people check out? I have. Inspiration? I have. I brought in two, two films. They're not well-known films. Okay. Um, I guess with my sporting background, you know, you'd expect me to sort of say something like Chariots of Fire or something like that, which is <laughs> yeah. a great movie. Classic. Great movie. Yeah. Um, but a much more sort of personal um, things are, are, are two that I've picked out. One's called Running to the Limits, and okay. it's, a, it's a film by a guy called Alex Vero, yeah. who um, was basically your typical overweight um, slob, really. Right. So if you, if you check it out, he was a big, big boy. Um, yep. There's a great picture of him on a, on a sofa with a big beer belly and a, <laughs> and a big bottle of Coke next to him and a big bag yep. of chips. Um, and he watched a documentary about how in the, um, in the 30s and 40s, how many British marathon runners there were and what their times were. Uh, and how now um, 
to virtually none. I mean, obviously you've got no, you've got no now Mo Farah taking up the marathon, but you yeah. know, it just dropped away. And why did it drop away? And he, he, he tried to get some funding to say, well, could he get from this big guy? Could he get to the Olympic qualifying uh, distance uh, okay. time, which I think was two hours eighteen minutes? Right. Uh, so it's a film about how he he set off. Uh, like I think it was about a three year journey yeah. to try and get himself in in shape to qualify for the Olympics. That sounds cool. Yeah. Uh, and the other book, the other film is called Unbreakable. Yeah. And it's a story of an ultra, which is a passion of mine, ultra running. Yeah. Um, and it's a documentary about the Western States 100, okay. and it features four of my all time ultra heroes um, yeah. uh, including a guy called Killian Jornet who's a, a fantastic guy uh, and uh, well worth looking at his books as well and it's the story about how these guys compete in this Western States 100 so okay. uh, another great, Brilliant. great film to Those check out Those two, great stuff Nice one Steve, good stuff and what about a person? Have you got uh, one person that has inspired you throughout your life? Well there's been, there's been a number of people that have yeah. mentored me over the years but I guess um, I was I was going to pick Lee J. Bock, who I mentioned earlier, who was yeah. my who was my badminton coach, uh, as an inspirational person. But you know what? In the end, I, I kind of I've opted for somebody a bit closer to home, who, who's a, a, probably my best friend, yeah. uh, and he's is a guy called uh, Quang Lee, uh, and he was a Vietnamese boat person, and I knew him for years and years and years before knowing that he was a Vietnamese boat person. Okay, and he, he's such a humble man. Yeah. Um, uh, he's the nicest person I've ever met. Uh, I run with him all the time. Yeah. Um, he's a great running buddy, and he always knows when we run together. He always knows exactly when to give me a kick up the backside, <laughs> and yeah. when I'm actually struggling, and we yeah. need to and he we need to well. stop and, and walk for a bit. Yeah. Um, and um, you know yourself if you run. When you run with somebody, you put the world to rights, don't you? You bond with people yeah. and you find out stuff about them. And one time we were doing, we were training for one of the marathons we were running together. Uh, so we were doing a long, I think, 18 miler one Sunday. And he started talking to me about his childhood and how he had to leave Vietnam uh, when there was a coup and they left, you know, with basically nothing. And they became, uh, you know, uh, they became the Vietnamese boat people, which many people don't remember now. If you're a certain age, it, it was all over the news. These yeah. these refugees, and how he came, and he was he was actually put in a camp, which sounds terrible, but it was just temporary housing. Mm -hmm. But it was a disused army camp. Um, yeah. So so they were all in these these cabins uh, in Sunderland, uh, and he you know he had to stay there until they were assimilated into society and stuff. Uh, and he and he used to carry his little sister on his back. Um, and it's an inspiring story, and it's a story about how, you know, somebody who came from nothing, you know, he's he's quite successful now, although he's very modest. He's, he's got like a restaurant and he's got shops and things, um, but he's never really changed. He's always a very humble person, yeah. and uh, and he's come through quite a lot of adversity, but he doesn't parade it. He it's just made him a very humble person, and and he's constantly an inspiration to me. Amazing, great. He sounds like a great guy. Good. Steve, thanks so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, all the work you're doing is it's incredible, and all the all the people that you've helped over the years, I'm sure everyone's really grateful for, for everything you've done. So, yeah, thanks for coming on, mate. I'd like to say I really appreciate it. Lastly, um, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, well, just look for me on the website, really. Um, yep. um, Steve Morley, uh, Inclusion Coach. Yeah. Um, you'll find my website. You'll find my... Um, Facebook page. Okay. I'm on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay. and you can, I mean, if you put stuff on your, your thing afterwards, you can I will do. Yeah. I'll put some links up. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. worries. Thanks for coming on, mate. I no. really appreciate it. No, it's a great pleasure. Thanks. Cool guys. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll catch you guys soon. Bye bye.